like dolphins are such wonderful beings like they will come to greet you when you are entering harbor really the school of dolphins will come and greet your ship they will uh, accompany you as you leave the harbor uh, there has never been a, a situation where a dolphin has uh, you know uh, attack somebody we are using dolphins and navies to uh, defuse uh, explosives and really yes so you can train dolphins very true one second are these like pet dolphins that you all no no these, these are, are wild wild dolphins in fact uh, we have now graduating to where we can do uh, slithering rappling uh, even free fall with them what yes because if we have to get deployed we have to carry the uh, uh, sniffer dog along so you're saying dogs are taken for skydives why not we are doing slithering and rappling with them as of now to a place of uh, an operation because they are the first line of defense they sanitize the route which our marcos can take to land up to a place which has got an explosive special forces podcasts are the ones that i look forward to the most had lots of para sf personnel on the show we've had one marcos legend the special forces of the indian navy is called the marcos we've already had vijaypal rawat sir on the show and now we have suresh babu sir on the show Fun trivia: The two of them actually served together in the Indian military for the longest time. They know each other; they're the best of friends. And the same way that we uncover the truths about the Navy, the maritime forces, the Marcos with Vijay sir, we did the same with Suresh Babu sir. So, if you're someone who enjoys our special forces specials, make sure you watch this one till the end. For more episodes of the Renvi Show, make sure you follow us on Spotify. Every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. This is Suresh Babu sir on T R S. Captain Suresh Babu, this one's gonna be a fun episode. How are you, sir? All fine and all ready to go. Okay, I'm saying this in a very uh, positive manner, but I absolutely love meeting commandos for two reasons. You guys are the most humble personnel from the military, and I would like to know why. And the second reason is you guys have like a great sense of humor, which uh, I don't see generally in a lot of the guests that we meet. Not just military, but generally, I feel like these two things stand out about commandos. Other than the fact that y'all are killing machines, like that's the other angle. So where do these first two angles come from? Basically, we're all peace lovers. Okay. Our job is no different from a doctor's job. We are trying to save lives, and in the process, some casualties happen, and we make the best out of the little time we get. So we remain happy and cheerful, and the the policy is be happy, and keep people around you happy. Yeah. If we can do th- these two, the rest will continue. Okay. Speaking about uh, humility again, you said something very interesting right before we began shooting about aggression versus humility. Could you repeat that for the audiences? Uh one is put through so much of training that what you learn the most is restrain. Mm. If you raise a hand, it is only to take a life and not for getting into some small skirmish mm. or small fight. hands were given to protect or to take lives and nothing else mm. so as you grow in service as you train hard you become that much more in control mm. and that much more softer okay so you come to my unit you'll find soft guys but hardcore mm. okay i want to ask you why you signed up to be a part of marcos we've had a very epic episode with uh, vijay rawat sir uh, it was one of our biggest blockbuster military episodes yeah. you've been sort of a brother to him uh, you know over the course of your career so yeah. there was two things i didn't ask him one yeah. was about uh, marco's training you know i didn't touch upon it much and that's something i'd like to know from you yeah. because we know about american naval seals that they have hell week as far as i understand the marco's hell week is even more intense the True. indian marco's hell week so i'd like to know about that and uh, secondly i'd also like to ask you if there was something you feel i didn't ask him or the reality of the marcos so yeah. let's talk about the marcos sir sure, sure. Uh, yeah. let's begin with hell week talk 
Yeah. See, as a um, country, uh, our resilience is very high. Mm. We are used to dirt. We are used to uh, living in a uh, minimalistic way. We are used to Spartan living. We are brought up with a very you know, humble beginnings. We are not used to luxuries and things like that. So an average Indian can take more hardship mm. than any other individual in this world. So when it comes to training, our training, our trainees can take much more rigors than anybody else. We are not cushioned people. We are used to eating on the floor. We are used to pollution, dust and dirt. So you'll be fine. You'll see that most of our boys when they come for training can are prepared mentally for a lot more than what you know we, we have read or seen. So when you say hell week, hell week by the name goes, it is hell. We have already gone through nine months of diving course and then another four or five months of marine commando course. One second. So first is NDA where you get your basics, which is also kind of a ragada. It is a rigor. <laughs> <laughs> then after that, you sign up to be a commando. Yeah. Uh, and that's where these diving courses and commando courses begin. That's right. And even that, I'm sure, is a very crazy rigor. Very true. Emotionally, physically, mentally. Now you're talking about Hell Week, which is m even more of a rigor than all these other stages that we spoke about. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we Though we are pushing a guy physically, we are trying to break him mentally. We want an average guy who, when he's fallen dropping dead should be able to get up and walk three steps we don't want hussein bolt we don't want albatross we don't want specialists in any field we just want average guys who are mentally tough so that is where the hell week comes in we push them to their mental limit you know so that they go ring the bell on their own and the guys who don't ring the bell continue with the course it is uh, putting them through starvation, depri depriving of sleep, depriving of food, depriving of the basic things which an uh, average human being is exposed to. Can you expand on these a little bit? Starvation and sleep? Like, can you give specifics? See, a human being can live without food for two, three days. Anybody can. They can just live on water. But not eating... And doing rigorous exercises like a 40 kilometer march, you know, you have an escape and evasion. You know, there are times when buddies are left loose and not to be found in villages, towns, roads, but you still have to reach the target. You have ustads swamping, swamping every junction. So you have to go through culverts, you have to crawl through nalas, you'll have to find a way through uh, fields. And in an urban jungle, it that becomes that much more tougher. And you're not allowed to eat. You're not given food to eat. So you have to figure out your own food. Exactly. Wow. There are days when we have lived off uh, raw brinjols with <laughs> our teeth going grey. My God. <laughs> we have set traps and had a uh, lot of snakes and frogs because plenty available in the forest. See, a snake is a lot of meat in one go. You cut off the head and the tail. The skin comes off like a socks. You roll it over a twig and just over a light flame and you have a lot of food to eat. So you live off the jungle. So you learn as you progress. And places like Belgaum, uh, Virangte, these are ideal places to train us. Does hunger change the way you perceive food? And you perceive snakes and frogs? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, after uh, going through that kind of training, anybody who serves you food is God for you. <laughs> you would never complain ever in your life that salt is less or sugar is more. Because food is like, like a blessing thereafter. What does it do to the mind emotionally, mentally when you're at that level of starvation and when that roasted snake is in front of you? See, it makes you understand that you can survive without food and you can survive with whatever is available. You know, you can just uh, squeeze a root and drink the water from it. You can set up a small filter using a piece of cloth and get the dew drops and drink it in the morning. You know, nothing seems not palatable. 
and we are taught in the course that never eat anything attractive in the jungle anything that's pretty very pretty <laughs> anything which a monkey eats you can have it so these are small uh, tips which are given through your training which comes in very handy as you you know grow in the kada of uh, a part of your marco's training is details about diving you actually dived supposedly where dwarka existed yeah you've dived near mahabalipuram what's the scariest thing you've seen while diving yeah scariest was when i was diving on pns ghazi uh, the earth's while uh, uh, 1971 war uh, thing as because when we went down how do i explain it uh, imagine our cricket team returning after winning the world cup you know everybody chucking um confetti's you know those white things falling from all over and you know even a long shot you can just see white strips and the team moving the center that is how it was when i went down to ghazi years of fishing nets and trawls have covered it and all these fishing nets are standing around the samaran and it's pretty creepy for a diver to go down because your legs your pipes all are getting entangled in them you know what initially strikes you is that you are getting into one kind of a quagmire where you're not going to come out of it i just want to tell the listeners that we're talking to a commando here whose <laughs> job is to go and recover dead bodies from rivers lakes ponds so if sir is saying it's scary uh we need to understand the fear angle here was really really <laughs> it's a very intense un- unnerving uncomfortable feeling when you are getting you are trying to reach uh, uh you know a structure under water at 23 26 meters depth that's the depth in which ghazi is lying and you are not able to reach it because of this years of fishing nets getting you know entangled with the samaran and uh, when you reach there it looks like a big whale which has uh, deteriorated decomposed and you can only see the ribs and the front portion is kind of blown outwards when you were exploring the wreck yeah is there anything you want to share with the listeners like what yes yes see? when you ask me what was so scary we we tried entering through the f- foxel i mean the front portion of the samaran yeah. we call it the foxel and the stern uh, through one of those skeletal you know uh, formations and out came one of those big fish you know big when i say about 8 feet long <laughs> out of nowhere you know not a shark not a shark of course okay and we were two buddies and luckily we we had a camera in hand we had our headlamp in hand in fact one of the divers dropped the camera mm-hmm. <laughs> and was rushing up uh, the first thing that you are taught in diving is never rush up to the surface mm. because mm. you can have an air embolism and uh, you know have a lung burst what's the depth again 26 to 20 28 meters depth oh. she's just about 2 miles from the harbor mouth mm. where she was waiting you know uh, to knock down our uh, carrier you you might have to give some context to the listeners about uh, ghazi in the year 1971 14th of november that she sailed out of Ka- karachi and uh, the indian uh, navy had uh, you know made our adversary to believe that the aircraft carrier was in Vishakhapatnam while she had never left Bombay harbor it was through a series of misinformation campaign a series of signals and uh, communication you know open uh, communication which made them believe that the aircraft carrier was in Vaisai and so she was sailed out Ghazi with a sole mission of destroying Ayanas Vikrant and also vessels of opportunity on its way. Mm. So she was sailed out on 14th November in 1971 and she took about two weeks to come this side. And on my birthday, that is 28th November, uh, was when she got the orders to arm her torpedoes and be ready to uh, destroy Vikrant. Unfortunately for them... Um, they have to come and possibly identify before they launch their top torpedoes and 
one of the theories uh, suggests that uh, when she came up to take um, you know a visual confirmation that is only the periscope out maybe they encountered a, a larger naval vessel and to uh, avoid collision she went in for a um, emergency dive and the depth being so less must have hit the bottom so hard that the already armed torpedoes and uh, you know uh, mines which they had kept for deployment must have exploded, exploded. Mm. in the forward section so that is how the uh, forward section has a blast uh, and why is this important for the indian navy because it's a part of history no the very fact that uh, we managed to um, miss in form miss guide another adversary uh, to move such an asset all along you know from all over the west to the east coast and uh, which uh, unfortunately ended in its own explosion and sinking mm. uh, it itself is a big success god like during world war uh, you know the landing on normandy uh, was saved because uh, there was a misinformation campaign which went on for 2 years mm. that the landing was happening in calais and not in normandy mm. and the germans uh, left that coast unguarded mm. so it's a big success as far as military intelligence goes uh at marco's training school i all given training about how to deal with sharks how to deal with crocodiles in water bodies um uh, could you talk a little bit about that because yeah. um you know i mean that's the big fear that civilians have when they're swimming anyway even in lakes you're constantly thinking as a civilian that a crocodile is going to come and like chew my leg off from yeah. under this water or if you're swimming in the ocean it could even be at the beach there's always a thought at the back of your head because of the culture we've grown up in the movies we watch that a shark is just going to come and rip my arm out <laughs> very true very true so is that a valid fear firstly uh it is a valid fear but it can be dealt with Okay. See, a shark has got a blind dart in front. See, unlike we have eyes, both eyes forward, they have on the sides. Mm. So actually, you stand in front of a shark, it cannot see you. It's mm. got a blind dart. So all that you have to do is to be right ahead of a shark mm. and freeze for some time. Either he'll just swim past you, or uh, you know, move away. But you need that little confidence in yourself to stop and. as if they stare in his eyes <laughs> because the uh, the animals normally attack you when they can smell the release of adrenaline in you which is fear fear when you feel fear they'll be they can smell attack. your fear which is why you know lots of city folks younger people when they're scared of dogs if they go near the stray dog they'll be like <laughs> oh my god and then the dog is tempted to actually come up and like Very attack true. them it's the yeah. same logic but here we're not talking about dogs here we're talking about sharks, sharks which are capable of chewing your heart out yeah, yeah. so the, you can be rest assured that in a tropical water scenario we will not have those kind of sharks which uh, will come and uh, unprovocatedly attack you mm. so we are in safe waters <laughs> <laughs> i remember with uh, vijay sir we spoke yeah. about marine animals and he said that there is some kind of technique where you have to stare the animal in the eye right. and tell the animal stay away from me <laughs> but through your eyes what is this logic is do you think that animals generally and i'm not just being on marine animals have an ability to tell what's happening in your mind like is there some kind of telepathy that happens between you like because technically all of us also monkeys we are yes, animals ourselves yes. so there is some kind of interaction on a primal level that we have with these wild animals so what is this logic so staring an animal in, in the eye it is just that uh, it's like uh, facing an interview you will look into the eyes and you know clench your fist and bang the table and shoot with confidence you get through mm. uh, i think a predator also gets the same kind of signal from you when you can actually stare him down saying that i don't feel uh, deterred by you and it is you 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 know who has to be scared of me kind of a thing so it does help to get that little poise in you to you know look into the eyes and say you know i am the boss <laughs> you've had to do that luckily no <laughs> okay what do you learn about these animals over time the more you dive the older you grow as a man 
the more experience you gain as a commando what do you learn about the animals actually animals are very um, helpful creatures helpful they love to be of help to humans like dolphins are such wonderful beings like they will come to greet you when you are entering harbor really a school of dolphins will come and greet your ship they will uh, accompany you as you leave the harbor uh, there has never been a, a situation where a dolphin has uh, you know uh, attack somebody we are using dolphins and navies to uh, defuse uh, explosives and really yes okay let's talk about this let's let's talk about the nature of dolphins first i think listeners know that they intelligent animals yeah but i think what you're saying is that they're sort of the equivalent of dogs of the ocean yes so you can train dolphins very true one second are these like pet dolphins that you're no no these, these are, are wild wild dolphins see for example you have a mine underwater a diver's job is to go and place a mine lifting bag in its proximity and come away and operate it from remote and the mine lifting bag fills in air and brings the mine up now the same job can be done by a dolphin because there are times when your squib that is the remote doesn't work so someone has to physically go and operate the you know switch for the air to fill in dolphins are trained to go down to a depth next to a mine and operate this so that the mine can come up it can be towed to a beach and countermined and blown up i hear you and this is pardon my language fascinating as fuck but how do you begin training a wild dolphin like i as in how do you even decide that okay that's the wild dolphin and train this is some free willy shit i don't know if you've seen yeah, free yeah, willy yeah 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 it's uh, very similar dolphins can be trained they are very smart they are trained uh, for you know carrying people for shows you would have seen they can do flips they can you know swim and synchronize with you okay have you interacted with these no no i've i've just uh, been privy to a lot of literature on this but i have not uh, come across but the indian navy uses no we have trained dogs on land <laughs> labradors every unit has got a couple of labradors which is trained for uh, sniffing uh, explosives and it's a nice process we send our men uh, they train with that uh, pup for 6 months and both become a integrated unit and they come back and they're deployed together and uh, they are very playful but the moment you put a harness they are like on job and the worst thing that can happen is they go and sit somewhere they don't bark because that bark can trigger off an explosive they just go and sit the moment they sense pain there's something wrong and then we can start the process of uh, identifying and diffusing it mm. so compare that to a mumbai or delhi labrador that sits at home and eats <laughs> chicken kebab <laughs> <laughs> now these guys have got ranks they can get uh, they've got allowances they've wow. got yeah yeah ranks i don't know <laughs> this in fact uh, we have now graduating to where we can do uh, slithering rappling uh, even free fall with them what yes because if you have to get deployed we have to carry the uh, um sniffer dog along so you're saying dogs are taken for sky dives why not in tandem N- not at but in the process because we are doing slithering and rappling with them as of now to a place of uh, an operation because they are the first line of defense they sanitize the route which our marcos can take to land up to a place which has got an explosive wow i i <laughs> I I'm, I'm I'm a little stumped right now I don't even know what to ask you next though my my heart is with that dolphin conversation yeah, I yeah, mean yeah. so many questions about dogs so many questions about dolphins what I choose to ask you is um are dolphins dangerous at all like have you interacted with them while diving Purpoise is what you have in Indian waters a uh, very similar uh, you know breed of dolphins yeah they're very friendly they 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 are there when you are diving they are there when you are in our inflatable rafts they come up they, to you yeah they come as a school and uh, playfully you know circle you and uh, they coexist kind of they don't perceive you as a threat they are very friendly what have you learned about the intelligence because you know dogs are also intelligent creatures and when you have a dog of your own you realize oh it's got its own personality even if it's a 
dog of the same breed as another dog that you knew of the same breed the personalities can be very very different yeah, yeah. so you realize that intelligence exists in animals as well yes very much so yeah. i mean i've come across cases where dolphins have saved people uh, you know who are getting drifted away in a uh, surfboard mm they've uh, you know kind of nudged them to safer waters wow yes they're very uh, intelligent beings you know that's the issue with human beings that we gauge intelligence with scientific advancement but there are other forms of intelligence which are beyond our perception very true very like true. we may not even be the most evolved beings on this planet for all you know maybe whales are more evolved maybe dolphins are more evolved but we gauge intelligence based on our ability to make plastic and make nuclear power but maybe there are some other forms of intelligence very true why we do decompression to come up on surface mm. because of the you know inert gases but whales are equally mammals which go down to depth and come up on surface and they don't do decompression we have not at come to that state of advancement where you know we can flood our lungs with a particular liquid and draw oxygen from it mm. we have to like if i have to dive for an hour at say 100 meters depth it will take me a week to come up on surface have you seen whales while on dives one or the deployment of uh, port play we saw it on surface it was not okay. during a dive we had an interesting exercise where we left uh, two of our commandos in a open raft in the mid sea and uh, there were six nations uh, trying to uh, compete to detect them first <laughs> so <laughs> all the navies were coming from a whole lot of neighboring countries to for a exercise called the milan which happens every second year so whichever country detects them first so once we had left them adrift we got a, a message from them you know uh, saying that there are whales <laughs> around us and once you know a swish of the tail and they would be tossed uh, but luckily nothing happened and i think uh, to the sri lankan navy we detected them first is there any aggression in whales they are actually also very mild creatures and uh, they move at very slow pace and you know slow and steady and i have not come heard of any situation where they attacked you know mm. some diver or a boat okay let's talk about the indian ocean sir yeah um there's so much about the indian ocean that maybe even indians don't understand and i'd love for you to tell us about the furthest point in the indian ocean where you have been as a navy man like uh, how far out have you gone and have you gone to other oceans as well yeah the navy does take you to a lot of uh, countries in from a cadet's time to and almost in every rank mm. you get to sail to friendly nations uh, in the indian ocean region ior as we call it on goodwill visits not restricted to indian ocean uh, our ships have gone as far as uh, across the atlantic and gone gone to take part in uh, you know uh, celebrations in the us uh, we have gone as far as uh, australia uh, all along the uh, south china sea to uh, japan to russia uh, all the mediterranean countries we have sailing ships which take part in tall ship races mm. uh, every year so there is always this uh, um, goodwill visits which the navy uh, takes part in to tell them that we are there for you mm. and you are there for us so it's just about a four day halt in those countries and a lot of interaction of games and cultural activities and diplomatic exchange and so no. it has taken me uh, to many countries have you ever been in a situation which is a peace time situation where there's no combat and no operation involved but it's still a dangerous situation maybe because of weather or you know like there's a sh- there's a chance of a shipwreck or something happening have you been in a situation like that yeah yeah um we had been deployed um, in uh, somalia okay and uh, that was a peacekeeping mission uh, for about 2 3 months and uh, we had an interesting job in hand i was a young lieutenant that time and i was uh, asked to prepare a road to be blown up uh see when you're pulling out your forces uh, the ships are casting off and the aircrafts are casting off you're so vulnerable because there are no defenses to protect you 
So we were just the motley team of uh, two prahars, as we call it. Which is guarding, how many people? Yeah. How many people? About 16 of us. Uh, guarding the approach road to the uh, port. And for a month, I was given the job of uh, booby trapping the whole uh, you know, asphalt road with explosives. Because jeeps with Somali pirates can come up <laughs> and try to hurt you. A militant group can always do an assault. Okay. When you're at slow speed, you know, ships are maneuvering and there's no... So our job was just to blow it up sky high to give us that little time to exfiltrate. So that was a peace situation wherein there was, uh, you know, a constant threat involved. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about Somali pirates. Uh, I'm understanding from this conversation that you had some interactions with them. Yep. Uh, or Somali militant groups. Yeah. Maybe let's begin this particular section of the podcast with you giving context on who they are in the first place. What I understand is they were regular fishermen whose business was taken away by big fishing trawlers. And because of poverty, they turned to crime and terrorism. Correct me if I'm wrong. There might be some geopolitical scenario. Yeah. Uh, and now it's the most rampant modern form of piracy. Like when we talk about pirates, like pirates of the Caribbean, that was 200, 300, 400 years ago. Yeah. In 2022, this is what piracy is. And they try harming merchant vessels, which are transporting goods, transporting oils. Um, they hold them to ransom. They extort them, etc., etc. They try stealing resources. Yeah. And this has kind of become one of the main angles of worldwide navies to just protect merchant vessels from piracy. piracy. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add from a context basis? Yeah. See, uh, here is a very poor nation. Mm. <laughs> and uh, they see rich countries, ships passing, streaming past them, you know, with loads and loads of... And here, on land, all the men are dead f between the age of 14 to 40. Mm. Either fighting somewhere or in the course of, you know, skirmishes. Yeah. So the rich militant heads hire these poor fishermen, stack them up with a lot of fuel, and a little bit of weapons and launch them into the sea. And they target uh, ships which are you know, at high seas, board them, hold them for ransom and take the insurance money. In Malacca Strait, this was put down heavily by all the countries coming together. But here there are ships from all over the world passing through the Indian Ocean. 80% of the world's trade happens through the sea and of which 60% happens through the Indian Ocean. Why Indian Ocean? Sea lines of communication see, through the Suez Canal. Till they had to go around the Cape of Good Hope, it was a long route and it was not economically viable to sustain trade. But once the Suez Canal opened, they just come through the Mediterranean, cut through to south of Sri Lanka, hit Singapore and they're off. So it is the cheapest way of transporting large amounts of logistics. Mm. And the Indian Ocean, whoever controls the Indian Ocean, controls the trade of the world. Who controls the Indian Ocean right now? <laughs> we are the big brother in Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean is India's ocean. Mm. And uh, that is why we have uh, our uh, fleets, we have our uh, maritime reconnaissance aircrafts, which are constantly on patrol not only monitoring what is the movement in the ocean, but also the three main entries into the ocean. Okay. That is the Gulf, the Cape of Good Hope, and the Malacca Strait. And the piracy angle here is only from Somalia or are there other countries also involved in piracy? We have come across uh, other uh, countries also. Like? Um, we had a unfortunate case uh, with an Omanian uh, dog. Um, <clears throat> But it was luckily uh, taken well charge of. Otherwise, we'd have ended up in a situation like the Italian Marines of Kerala coast. Uh, you'll have to give some context. See, what happens is we have something called UNCLOS. That is the uh, laws of the sea, which govern um, you know, how to deal with various things uh, emerging at sea. And a pirate is not a militant. He's just a thief. Mm. And he cannot be killed. He can be warned. 
he can't even be maimed so it is so difficult for a uh, uh, a force uh, uh, you know which is there to protect your ship you know we are actually escorting our ships from you know doha to djibouti about eight nine countries are there including our own uh, ships now you 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 got a trained set of people and there is this uh, high speed boat charging at you now you cannot even open fire at him because unless you prove hostile intent you cannot shoot in the case of the italian marines they fired and unfortunately a fisherman died and that's how it became a national crisis between our country and italy and so we had similar situations where uh, we come across uh, these are just though you know those thin boats with high speed boats with four five obms in tandem you know like charging a motor. Hmm? a motor with a wooden yeah, boat outboard motors now how do we prove hostile intent mm. so in a particular occasion one of our uh, you know teams opened fire and uh, it grazed <laughs> a so called fisherman <laughs> and there was hell to pay uh, through the diplomatic circle and you know but how do people get to know like the fisherman goes and complains see they have very good communication um with their uh, people who control them back mm. home mm. and uh, in fact there was a situation there was a nexus between the militant groups certain ships crew and insurance agencies and these um pirates will only attack those ships where they have assured insurance money coming in mm. okay yeah <clears throat> um have you had any combat experiences with pirates my teams have been deployed but i have not uh, personally been involved because we have our teams embarked uh, for uh, anti piracy role so the uh, teams are constantly engaged in this kind of a situation are the pirates good at combat they are not they are not militants they are not terrorists they are not combatants okay they are just poor fishermen with the simple task of taking over a merchant ship for ransom mm. for okay. stuff okay so how the merchant ships around the world is geared for it every merchant ship is supposed to have a citadel a citadel is a safe room like this where all the crew gets in and lock themselves inside they retain control of the steering and communication and they can live for a certain number of days so in case the militants uh, the uh, pirates have taken over and our team is deployed to retake over you can fire at will because mm. whomever you shoot or neutralize will only be a uh, pirate and not the crew got it so the protocol for merchant vessels is get into the citadel, citadel. if there's a pirate attack yeah and if a navy actually gets onto the ship they are allowed to kill anyone on board kill or apprehend <laughs> apprehend which means what take them alive okay speaking about taking them alive when i was having lunch with vijay sir the last time he was here after the podcast yeah he told me that there was a point in his career where he had to have 40 eggs a day yeah you know he was eating a lot i'm sure you're the same you're also a hefty dude uh, all of you are hefty dudes yeah. <laughs> this is not the case with um the special forces of the army the para sf uh, they usually leaner dudes i want to understand this that why do marcos have to be so bulky is it because when you dive there's a lot of calories that are spent um and there's muscle loss is it because there's more hand to hand combat uh is it because the combat nature is different like what is the logic about marcos being buffed i think the upper body naturally becomes much more uh, profound as you do go through your training uh because uh, most of your uh, uh training involves lifting of weights and you know? mm. Uh, using your hands to uh, climb or to ascend uh, descend you know fast roping things like that and uh, we all fail our uh, bmi <laughs> body mass index test which is now irrelevant actually <laughs> according to the world of health it's not a correct mark it's of it's not health. a correct mark of yeah because mm. your upper body is developed so much that you will always be overweight for your height and age mm. Mm. so that is the flip side of uh, sticking to an old standard of uh, but an average indian uh, special force guy 
is not very bulky as mm. compared to the westerners mm. uh, and the americans and the europeans yeah. we are pretty lean mean fighting machine <laughs> <laughs> um you're just with every answer you're giving me so many places to ask you questions in um do you want to talk about a challenging combat experience you had like in your entire tenure which particular combat experience did you find the most challenging i wouldn't call it a combat experience but it was a life threatening experience um <clears throat> there was this um trawler which had uh, been scuttled uh, and it was at the bottom of a jetty once uh, you mean it sank ha uh, what they do is when you capture a a, a trawler uh, what the um, the fishermen or whatever they do is they scuttle it a slow scuttle by opening the cocks underwater you you'll have to explain everything from okay. water trawler is to what scuttle okay. is okay imagine there's a korean fishing trawler in the indian ocean a trawler is a big ship big 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 trawler in the sense about uh, 60 meters long okay now uh, indian ocean is the only ocean where fish die of old age <laughs> <laughs> really because we don't exploit as much as we should Mm. and we have foreign uh, countries uh, big uh, trawlers which come and poach in our waters and once in a while the navy and the coast guard uh, you know apprehend them b- escort them to the nearest harbor and the crews handed over to the police now in order to uh, hide the catch you know if you don't have evidence you can't sue them they open up these small wells in the bottom of and the water starts filling in so while it's seemingly floating by the time it comes to the harbor and you secure them they sink okay, okay. so we had one such trawler which uh, was scuttled one thing they sink and what they escape no uh, they have been apprehended but all that the catch that they have is underwater now it is up to the navy to again go and bring out whatever is underwater but what's the to- what's the point of sinking it if you can if we can't have it you can't have it it's just ego <laughs> it is just ego okay and make it that much more difficult for us now the uh, uh, jetty is inoperable for that duration till we pull her out we can't get our ships alongside you know it is just a nuisance value and here i was returning from of bajrang you know of in assam you know which i just spoke about earlier and i was uh, asked to go and salvage this uh, particular trawler and um the all these fishing trawlers have these big fishing nets behind and big cleats you know which run to about 2 3 kilometers long that is the kind of net. and uh, it was becoming sunset time and i was uh, i said i'll just go in for a check dive you know and as a team leader we always do the first dive ourselves and uh, the the petty officer you know my number 2 warned me that sir please where a surface diving set you know where the supply comes from surface and not a independent set which will last for about 20 minutes i said i'm just going for a check dive i'll come out fast but the gray head petty officer said sir mat karo you know where a surface supply even if it takes a little time delay and what's I, the difference in the two sets the 20 in 20 minutes the um, oxygen runs out finish in surface diving sets in a independent you know like a scuba diving set okay but in a surface supply it is a continuous supply from okay. cylinders on top got it and the cylinders on your back is only for an emergency understood so i listened to the gray head uh, petty officer and i went in that and the moment i went in from behind and entered the whole trawler capsized underwater you mean it turned it yeah fell to one side from even keel it fell to one side and i was trapped between some 10 layers of fishing nets wow I, you were alone yes and it took them 4 hours to cut through those layers of fishing net to pull me out how did you communicate with them uh we have this uh, pipe going up so it is a system of pulls and bells one pull i'm okay and you know four pulls i want to come up three pulls i want to go down but what happened was because of the entanglement of the pipes i couldn't even signal them so you were close to death yes 
and if i had not listened to that petty officer and i gone in my independent set i would be a statue and not speaking to you today and uh, i started cutting from inside and they started cutting from top and i think it was almost 8 in the night when they finally pulled me out to the surface so you couldn't even see anything nothing so it was just darkness that you were stuck in the middle of no fear kicked in <laughs> but that's what you've been trained for hell we kicked in we are comfortable in dark we are much more uh, as you say masters of touch and feel underwater Just let me give the listeners some context here go to a beach at night and mm-hmm. try looking at the dark ocean yeah and then think of yourself stuck in the middle of that dark ocean with nets all around you underwater with a limited supply of oxygen that's how it is in most of the wrecks it is uh, uh, scary <laughs> to say the least i don't want to talk to the navy man in you here i want to talk to the human in you here yeah. what was going on in your head in those 4 hours i was very confident that uh, our men are there to pull me out and um, i just had to continue breathing and uh, we we go into something called a pendulum breathing we don't breathe like how we are breathing now you know <laughs> you breathe in hold and then release so that way uh, you know the body also goes into a state of calm and rest it's like a pranayam yes and the endurance also increases endurance and increases your endurance to you know uh, the amount of air you will consume the system also slows down otherwise by you know rapid breathing you are actually uh, pushing your lungs and your other uh, faculties you know, to hard work which will tire the whole body so pendulum breathing brings you to a state of calm and you continue doing your job uh, of cutting the various layers and hoping that there'll be a hand to pull you out any sea snake encounters plenty plenty they are the dangerous ones right only 3% of snakes in the world are poisonous okay i've i've read that it's mainly sea snakes that are poisonous <laughs> like the 3% are sea snakes so <laughs> <laughs> jellyfish is much more uh, dicey has it stung you no yes we have had many a cases so you? we we do carry vinegar with us so immediately put it on the spot where uh, you get the sting or you uh, piss on it yeah <laughs> <laughs> have you been stung that is the best cure actually okay. instantly even uh, goan uh, beaches uh, sometimes are kept out of bond because that blue bottle uh, jellyfish which comes during uh, a particular season but predominantly indian waters you have that orange colored uh, jellyfish which gives you a sting but doesn't cause any uh, you know violent uh, reaction in cochin yes during training there have been uh, a few cases where they had to be rushed to the icu really yeah why they uh, affect your nervous system and can just paralyze the whole okay. system so the less you panic the less the blood circulates and the less it will hit you so if you get stung try and not react <laughs> and try and not palpitate and try and not you know uh, make it worse is that true about pain and discomfort in general yes <laughs> because pain is in the mind pain is in the mind okay she do have one last question for you sir yes because this is something we didn't expand upon earlier yeah. which is the crazy food you've eaten during your commando tenure you spoke about eating snakes yeah i'm assuming when you're out at sea the rules change about food have you had to for the sake of survival have you had to eat anything completely insane yeah um uh, what happens is you cannot have sea water mm. at sea because mm. it dehydrates you yes so there's a very interesting uh, thing about fish that the fish has fresh water inside because of the osmosis so all that you have to do is squeeze a fish <laughs> and have fresh water <laughs> so any fish is basically like a water bottle water well. bottle of fresh water wow have, yeah and a lot of crabs uh, you know uh, you can eat raw i mean a lot of fish the japanese have it sushi so mm. there's nothing wrong in eating raw fish at all for the sake of survival have you had to just tear open a fish and eat it 
Yes, yes, very much. And we were lucky because we always had a boat in which we were in. And it had an engine. So all that we had to do was get a fish, uh, remove the scales, wrap it around the exhaust pipe for about 10 minutes and it gets nicely fried. <laughs> flip it over another five minutes and you have good fried fish going. It gets cooked because of the heat of because the engine. Because of the heat of the exhaust uh, engine. Wow. What does it taste like? Oh, as good as any uh, <laughs> <laughs> five star. <laughs> You'll carry masalas with you by any chance? If you're lucky, yes. <laughs> wow. Okay. Otherwise, the salt is enough to... And what about the jungles? Yes, jungles, uh, uh, we have to lay traps. Uh, we are taught to lay uh, traps for birds. And frogs are in plenty in our country. So frog legs are a delicacy outside. For us, it's basic uh, substance. Tastes like chicken? Very much. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wow. Anything else crazy that you've eaten? I've eaten raw vegetables for just uh, because of hunger. <laughs> <laughs> That's the craziest <laughs> That's thing. That's the craziest. And I had uh, our full mouth uh, cut because we had raw cashew fruit okay. uh, for want of anything else to eat. Mm. Uh, and uh, in fact, the whole uh, team was uh, reported to the by the farmer mm. saying that, sir, my field got uh, raided last night. And when we were uh, lined up, we all had that, you know, uh, lips and all of us disowned that we had. <laughs> uh -huh. Wow. Uh, do you believe in ghosts sir, at all? Uh, not really because uh, student of science and okay, uh, we need uh, facts and figures to believe in them. Right. But I think uh, a predominant uh, number of people do believe in ghosts and uh, I, feel, I look at them more as angels, mm. not as ghosts. Okay. Because we've lost uh, comrades, friends in close proximity, in action. And somehow I feel they're watching over us and protecting us. So mm. I look at them as angels and not as ghosts. You feel a presence of the brothers? Very much, yes. yes. Uh, during our worst uh, situation, uh, we know that, you know, somewhere... Uh, they're being, we are being watched over with a you know, hand protecting us. Have you been shot? Ever? Shot at? Yes. <laughs> but it's not hit you. Uh, it was a very uh, interesting situation where we were doing a door-to-door <clears throat> -door, uh, search, uh, you know, and I was with the Gurkhas that time. And the Gurkhas are known for their unflinching loyalty to their officers. So I had two of them on either side and... Uh, uh, I was to knock on the door uh, to interrogate. We had all the windows and doors covered and uh, the middle of the night. And when I opened the door, one guy came with all, you know, oh, who are you? You know, how dare you enter my house and kind of touched me or something. Like that. <laughs> These two guys immediately drew their weapon, you know, their Kukri. kukris. And that guy shot. I mean, everything happened in such speed but we do have protective gear so uh, so the bullet hit your protective gear we all yeah like a bulletproof vest BPJ, yeah what does it feel when it hits the vest it is uh, it's the impact is pretty hard but if it is not uh, in a crucial place <coughs> you can I mean you can bounce back immediately otherwise it'll take a little while to you know get back but it takes the impact. Uh, we have graduated in bulletproof jackets too, from KVLR, which was based on the spider web, to uh, ceramics, which have got, you know, break and capture. You know, one layer shatters and one layer captures. So it is lightweight and uh, thinner and easy to move around. Have you been injured in a combat situation? Like, you know, does your foot twist or do you get any kind of joint injuries i have <laughs> been safe <laughs> that way I, okay. uh, other than um, when a, there was a sea dive um, and uh, we have a weight 50 kg weight which is lowered first and we uh, go down on that but the sea state was so you know rough high and rough 
that with me sitting on the 50 kg weight we were getting tossed around 6 feet up and down in the bottom and uh, me and my buddy had got entangled uh, and entangled in a way that we couldn't go up mm. and uh, finally the uh, supervisor realized and uh, hauled up the weight with two of us on a winch onto the ship <laughs> with, with all the pipes around us and you know <clears throat> choking us uh, that was i think one of the most nightmarish dives <laughs> i've had hmm. while i can keep unpacking questions with you sir <laughs> we have to head into a second episode we have to do many more episodes with you i feel okay which is why i'll ask you one kind of hard question that often reveals the character of a human being which is that i know you have three kids who are grown adults now but save they were children again and you knew that you have only one day left on earth and you could pass on only one lesson to the three kids what would that lesson be after having experienced what you experienced and after having seen what you've seen in the ocean as i told you earlier also i just have one message for my children from everybody learn to be happy and keep people around you happy everything else will fall in line on this earth okay that's what your navy and your taught you as well yes very much yes because it's much more about maintaining team morale very true maintaining human morale around you very true maybe you've explained the core of leadership in that one sentence i hope so um, yeah do you learn more about leadership as life goes forward very much every day is a learning process and you learn so much from people whom you meet every day in fact uh, when i was a lieutenant commander and we were stopped somewhere to have lunch a young sub lieutenant told me that uh, my dad taught me something always ask the name of the person who serves or drives a car or a, and next time when you meet him call him by his first name and see how different he reacts and from that day on, i don't call anyone driver or server or waiter i get to know the name and call him by the name next time and you should see it. it's so different mm-hmm. i mean you learn every day something from somebody <laughs> captain suresh bahu this is fantastic talking to you um so much to say to you so many questions for you i'll end this particular episode by saluting you and saying thank you for your service sir. Uh, on behalf of the country and the youth and everyone who watches TRS uh, this was a great first episode but uh, there's a lot more to learn from you so i hope you had a good time on the show yeah sir. i had a great time too and uh, there's a lot of fun sharing so much that has happened in our lives and look forward to many such interactions likewise sir. Right. thank you appreciate it thank you that was another special with another special forces veteran I'd love to know from you guys who else you all would like to see featured on TRS. We're always looking for new military perspectives to showcase on the show and to share with you all. So please drop some suggestions in the comments below. And until next time, follow us on Spotify. Every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. TRS will be back soon.